a great pleasure to be talking about this topic, which is something that I've been thinking about sort of for the past three years, um, starting with some work with Anson Bibushan and Catherine Zurich, who is at Berkeley, um, and then doing a bit more work on some more formal QFT aspects in current space time with Catherine and Hogan, and then most recently working with um, a general, a numerical general relativist, which is not a sentence I ever thought, I, a phrase I ever thought I'd have to say in full, um, <coughs> Will East, who is a perimeter, uh, working on various aspects of this. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, this instability in the standard model takes potential, which I'm sure everyone is quite familiar, but the idea is that if you calculate the Higgs potential within the standard model, you find that the electroweak vacuum, which is somewhere way down here, is not actually a global minimum of the potential, it's only a local minimum, and that the potential turns over, and then it runs away to some true vacuum that is assumedly well out here, perhaps at around the fine scale. Um, but so here I'm using capital lambda to denote the point at which the potential turns over. And the fact that the general <coughs> Higgs potential looks like this, and the fact that I'm here giving the talk, are not necessarily you know, experimentally inconsistent, because the lifetime for tunneling out of the electroweak vacuum today is in excess of the age of the universe. And this is known for a long time, and this is why we generally call the electroweak vacuum metastable as opposed to unstable. Um, but if you consider that there was a period of inflation before today, then there is an interesting pre-question, which is, well, it's great that once we are here, we sit here for long enough for you know planet stars people to develop. But what about if we did have an inflation? So, so how robust does that say? If I want to throw some other, is, is this some thing that's very special about just the standard electric model, or can I easily fix it by throwing some terms in? Yeah, I mean, so so for example, um, so when you say like you mean new physics in the sense of new particles, a couple or of things, or just or like just yeah, fiddle with the potential a little bit. So yeah, it's an interesting question. So within the, I'll talk a little bit more about this in the experimental context at the end. But the um, if so, there are a range of things you can imagine doing. First of all, you could imagine there's just new physics coupled with pegs. Depending on the form of the new physics, that can either make this sort of more true or less true or not true. Um, by affecting the shape of the potential. Uh, another thing is actually at just at sort of, at just the boundary of the um, three sigma confidence contour. So th this is sensitive to the parameters that go into the model, notably the Higgs quartic coupling measurement, or the equivalently the Higgs physical mass measurement, and the measurement of the top quark mass, or you call it. And if you're just at the edge of the sort of three sigma preferred region, it turns out that this is um, that the, the potential remains stable up to the fine scale. So th this is a statement about yes, yeah, so that's a good point. Actually, clever. This is a statement about the this is a statement about the standard model potential with the central values of the quartic and the um, top quark Yukawa is measured, and I'm, I'm going to use it as a motive. I'm going to use it. Part is an interesting connection between particle physics and cosmology, but also part is a motivation just to think about if I did have a setup like this during inflation, like I had some field with an instability, what would the inflationary epoch look like for a field like that? So, but yeah, and yeah, if you... For example, we had a talk, was it last week, where there was an SCET determination of the top mass that lowered it by one GeV, and that gets you within two sigma. Being stable. To relax the pressure. Relax yeah, it, the it pressure. used to be the the old central limit used to be um, <coughs> like one seventy three point three four from this D zero CDF combination, and now it's more like one seventy two point four or point six or something as a result of the most recent update from Atlas and Tabor. SCET further lowers it a bit. <laughs> well, and then there's this. There's yeah. I mean, we can talk about this. There's this. Interesting aspect that the, you know the what what is measured in experiments doesn't exactly map to what the like MS bar parameter is because we use you know. <coughs> okay, yeah. So I'm going to start with this set of this instability in the Higgs potential, and I'm going to ask the question of if we did have if we do have an unstable potential like this, 
where our electric weak vacuum is not the global minimum, how did we get, like, what does it look like to try to start, to, to, to try to be in this vacuum and then have a period of inflation? Uh, is this curl a total population or Pardon? The, the, this is This is actually um, <coughs> using one, uh, one two u beta functions, one loop, Coleman Weinberg. It, it holds the higher loop orders too, but. Uh -huh. um, it's just, just, just one. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the, important, the important aspects to answering this question are you can really break it down into sort of two sub questions. The first, is how, how does the Higgs field, in particular fluctuation in the Higgs field, evolve during inflation? Um, and that's important because you need to know whether or not during your inflationary epoch the field is actually going to sample this unstable part of the potential. Um, and so that's the first question because you need to know, like, is inflation actually, you know, if you start in the electric vacuum, is inflation actually going to cause you to transition out of the electric vacuum? And then the second question is, of course, if you do manage to fluctuate out of the electric vacuum, do you care what happens? And you know, that can be boiled down to what is the impact of these large fluctuations, both in terms of how the field keeps evolving and in terms of what happens to the surrounding space time. Um, and so now, you know, I'm going to just very quickly present my trigger warning. And my trigger warning is that I'm going to assume some, like, if you are if you know that stops are at a TV and we're going to see them any day now and that's going to solve this problem, then, you know, stop is not for you. I apologize. Uh, well, unless you want to learn something about QFT. Um, but so I'm going to assume, I'm, like I said, one of my starting points is going to be that the standard model is valid to high energies. Uh, another thing for people who are more, who have prejudices about inflation, I'm going to assume that inflation started in some sense ideally. So I'm going to assume that you know, I'm, I'm not going to do inflationary model building. I'm not going to talk about the evolution of the inflaton during inflation. I'm just going to assume sort of like an inflationary background and then start with just the Higgs in that inflationary background as setup. I'm going to, I'm not going to deal with non-curvature, uh, non-minimal curvature couplings or higher order terms in, you know, Einstein's equations. And I'm also going to neglect <coughs> subleading that corrections, uh, for example, notably in this plot, you can see there is no usual Mexican hat shape that you're used to. I'm going to neglect things like mass corrections that are so um, But I'll talk a little bit about that at the end if I get time. So, okay. So with that set up, uh, jumping right into the first question. So how does the Higgs field evolve during inflation? Well, so there are two, I think you might think about this as a special question, but there is, many people are used to the, evolution of a scalar field during inflation, and in particular one aspect, which is the sort of stochastic evolution, the h on 2 pi fluctuations that you get in a massless scalar field. So what, that, what happens there is if you have a scalar field during inflation, then as, uh, your various as your various modes go out of causal contact during inflation with the shrinking of your co-moving horizon, then these, these, mode, these fluctuations in the mode lead to a sort of local field value, or by local I mean over the size of a Hubble volume. So the, the freezing out of these fluctuations in modes leads to a local field value that's the sum over all the supervising modes, and this happens for a number of massless fields. Uh, people are familiar, for, for example, if you work on axions, then you know, the axion is, uh, if, Petschy Quinn field is broken during inflation, and the axion is a light scalar field. It acquires these H on 2 pi fluctuations as a result of this process. Um, the much more, if, if you are worried about this in the context of like the Higgs or axions, then the much more prosaic <laughs> example is this is exactly what leads to, th this is exactly what the fluctuations in the inflaton field are. Once you consider sort of slow roll inflation and you have a homogeneous background value for the inflaton, then the fluctuations around that homogeneous background value are effectively massless excitations, and they undergo approximately H, they receive approximately H on 2 pi fluctuations. But the result, of, the result of these fluctuations are that if you imagine that with each successive mode crossing, your, the value of your field in a local Hubble size patch region is fluctuating according to whether the mode crossing leads to sort of a constructive interference or a destructive interference, 
then this results in the Higgs field undergoing a sort of random walk within each patch with each subsequent node crossing. And so my incredible Mathematica produced artist rendition of that is here. So if you're in sort of one dimensional space and you have the Higgs field and a Hubble patch is just sort of a tiny, you know, two pixels on the screen, then if you have these various modes that have crossed the horizon and frozen out, then the actual field profile is locally the sum of all of these preceding modes. So that's the sort of stochastic evolution of the field. Uh, and like I said, that's the sort of thing you might be used to from, inflation, from the infloton or from axions. Um, but of course, in the case of the Higgs, and what we really care about here, is that the Higgs also has this potential, specifically this unstable potential, and that's going to drive some net evolution of the field uh, depending on the derivative. So we want to incorporate both of those effects. What, how are we going to do that? Well, the machinery to do that that was first applied to the Higgs by these authors back in 2007 is something called the Fokker Planck equation. And the Fokker Planck equation is not something you generally see, you might not see generally in a particle physics context, but it's very familiar from statistical mechanics. So what it models is it models a sort of test particle that's in a thermal background. So in other words, the particle receives some sort of stochastic motion from the thermal background, but there might also be a net force on the particle as a result of, for example, flow in a fluid. And so that's exactly what this equation does. Uh, P gives the probability to find one of these hubble sized patches exhibiting a certain field value at a time t. And it incorporates both the effect of the potential, the net, of, the net driving effect of the potential, and also there's this stochastic noise term. And so this, is, this equation is exactly what's going to give us the evolution of the Higgs field during inflation. So an important, so you look at this and you think, great, I'll just apply it. And you know, given some initial probability distribution, I can get the probability distribution throughout <coughs> inflation. Uh, of course, though, there's, a, there's an interesting que pre-question that goes into this which is exactly, you know, exactly what potential do I use? And the reason this is relevant is because, like I said, we care about this instability in the potential, but, you know, should we be using, you know, what, what sort of potential should we be plugging in here? Should we be using Weinberg? Should we be using just a tree-level potential with the running coupling? Um, and so this is, I think, an interesting question because, uh, first of all, many previous studies of this Many previous studies took many different approaches, and some people, and frequently what was easiest, so solving this equation is very, very easy if you throw away the potential term. So, because then it's just Gaussian fluctuations. So what many people did is they just threw away the potential term. So then you don't have to worry about what the right potential is, but it does mean that you lose the effects of the potential. Um, Sorry, could, you, could you just say a little bit more? I know you're sort of good, but what is the physics that goes into this equation? What exactly is the model that gives me this equation? So w what you can do, what you can do is you can. Um, so there, there are a number of derivations of it dating you know, back quite a while. But the the idea is if you just if so, what you basically want is you want a p that's going to give you, that's going to allow you to calculate. Um, let me put that. In. So. If P were to be the probability distribution of finding, you want P to give you this probability distribution. So what you want it to have the capacity to do is give you the various, like for example, you want its moments, the moments of P, to reproduce the um, correlate, like local uh, um, coincident point correlation functions of the field, right? So for example, when I, it, integrate this with respect to h squared, I want to get whatever the two-point function is of h squared. And so if you imagine, if you were to take, so subject to that sort of requirement, is in I want this to reproduce the two-point functions of the Higgs field or the four-point function of the Higgs field, but with the addition of a Gaussian random noise term, then that's the sort, of, that, that is the, starting point that you use to derive this equation is the equation of motion for that distribution. Um, and you can see certain aspects of it, for example, uh, so like one thing that I'll mention in a second, but like this is exactly the, the term that you would expect for a field that's slow roll evolving, 
in... So for example, if, 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 if there was no potential, this was just a massless particle, then somehow, then we just literally have some Gaussian fluctuations, and presumably this thing is then exact. Right, yeah, so if, if, I threw, if I threw this away, I would just get something that had fluctuations that grew, grew as h on 2 pi. Um, and it would be completely Gaussian, so the second moment would determine all higher moments. But then this term is getting right the leading corrections to the two-point function outside the horizon or something? Precisely. Um, and, yeah, you can... And like as I and as as I mentioned, if you look at this, you can see that this is exactly the sort of term that you expect for a slow rolling field in an inflationary background, right? The normal, you know, if I had, um, you know, normally I have something that looks like would look like h double dot plus three, um, three. Well, I should write this because it's got different h's, but. You know, my classical equation of motion would look something like this, right? And so, the, what I'm sure this is actually derived in the slow roll approximation, but it's this, um, like that's capturing this part of the classical equations of motion, and that's what's giving you the leading order correction as a result of the potential. Um, okay, so so an interesting question is what is the correct what is the correct potential to going here, and uh, I think this is interesting because it's a, you can sort of think of this as an exercise in Wilsonian effective field theory, which is, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to do a calcul, if I'm going to consider, you know, like, what is my theory? I'm going to start from some UV theory, and then I'm going to talk about this theory that is really just the theory of the superhorizon modes of the, of the Higgs. And so given that I want a theory that's a theory of superhorizon modes, I only need to include the superhorizon degrees of freedom. And so, in the same way that you'd normally think, like, well, if I'm constructing a low energy EFT, then I run down and whenever I cross a mass threshold, well, at that point, the, the mass of the heavy particle starts suppressing all of its mode functions, so I integrate that out of my theory. Well, an interesting thing that happens in the center space is that the mode functions of fermions and gauge bosons are suppressed not just by having a mass, but also by being outside the horizon. So if I'm looking at if I'm looking at the a theory of superhorizon modes, then I'm also integrating out all fermions and gauge bosons because they decay rapidly outside the horizon. So my potential is really just the normal Higgs potential, um, or sort of the normal quartic potential, and so I don't need a bunch of one-loop effective Kolmany Weinberg type things. I just you know, I can just evolve with this simple potential, which is good because that makes solving this equation easier. But, you know, you also, I, I also need to, like when I run down, I also need to match onto a certain, you know, I need to match onto this potential with whatever came from the UV. And that is important because that's what determines what this quartic is going to be. And specifically, if I go back to my, you know, EFT reasoning, well, when I'm in the very UV, the fermions and gauge bosons do contribute, and that's because in the very UV, you know, de Sitter space looks like flat space, like the modes basically don't know about the de Sitter space. So the fermions and gauge bosons do contribute to this problem in the sense that they determine, the, they, they renormalize the coupling down until we get to this horizon crossing region. Um, and so what that tells us is that, okay, I'm going to, take my measurements, I'm going to run all the way up to the UV, that just in flat space, that tells me, you know, the quartic at any specific value um, in Minkowski space, and then I'm going to run down from the UV, and I'm going to integrate out any non-scalar state if the scale of its mode function becomes suppressed. And so that's going to give me this quartic potential where a good scale to plug in is this renormalization scale. And so, as mentioned, what are the consistency checks? Well, if I'm in the limit of large H, then the fermions engage bosons, their mode functions decay at the horizon. So that gives me the scale around H. But the other important thing that I need to account for is that if I did have, you know, if I do have a large Higgs value, then that gives a, effectively a mass threshold for these states. And so if I were in the large H limit, basically throwing that away, then these states would decouple and I'd want to match at a higher scale. Um, 
And so once again, that's I think a nice that, that's a nice intuitive you know Wilsonian argument as to why that's the right potential. You can go further and you could say, well, really the potential that I'm using is as mentioned should be recreating the right correlators. Um, and so you actually can go through and think about this in terms of, for example, a calculate like a calculation of correlators in um, a calculation of correlators in a sitter background. And you find that if you, and for example, you can just consider the toy H to the 4 theory. And you discover that when you do the toy calculation, where you do you know, just the regular two-point function, and then you have a loop contribution to the two-point function, and then you have higher loop contributions to the two-point function, you find that you get two types of uh, contributions. First of all, you get UV contributions. But you also end up getting these, what are called these IR, like these IR logs that are exactly what's leading to the super horizon growth of the correlator um, and is related to the appearance of the scale factor in the modes, in your mode, in your mode calculation. And so a toy calculation like this is useful because it tells us two things. First of all, when you do it properly, and I uh, refer anyone who's interested to either discussion with me or details in this paper with Hojin Yu and Captain Zurich. But when you do this properly, you find two things. You find, first of all, that desirably, as has been known for a number of years, indeed it is the case that the Fokker-Planck formalism is resumming these leading IR logs. So that's good. It's creating what we want. But it also gives you the hint as to, you know, it's, it's much harder to do this calculation in the full standard model, but it does give you the right hint as to how you should be treating the standard model, which is that you expect the standard model fields, you know, they're not going, you know, if you think about it now, we don't integrate all the way from, we only integrate over the super horizon modes that are unsuppressed. And so now, as opposed to integrating from the lowest scale mode, the sort of scale at the beginning of inflation, we just integrate from AH, and so we still get a UV contribution, and in particular a logarithmic contribution, but we don't get the corresponding IR contribution. And so that mean, that's exactly, again, what suggests to us that that's the right way, that the right way to treat the standard model fields is that we treat them as renormalizing the potential, but not contributing. Okay, so uh, with all of that set up, we can now go ahead and we can't actually, for, for the, this complicated Higgs that we can't actually solve the Fokker-Planck equation analytically, but we can solve it numerically. Um, and so here are some numerical results. This is like, even, even though I've given variations on this slide, this is always my favorite moment because I don't know that as a, as a phenomenologist I will ever get to show videos in another talk. <laughs> uh, but so here's, here's going to be how the Fokker-Planck solution evolves. For, so this is the probability distribution and we're not quite starting with a delta function that's at h equals zero, but we're going to start with a very small spread that corresponds to the quant like just quantum fluctuations after like an eighth of an e-fold. And then what's going to happen is as I play this, we're going to run forward the number of e-folds and watch how the probability distribution evolves. And then um, two, thing two things that you uh, might, that your eyes of course immediately drawn to. First is what I'm going to call h equals hcl. The exact definition of this is not what I'm about to tell you, but for the moment, what you can just think of it as is this is some point that is just beyond uh, the turnover and the potential. So this is a pretty good proxy for a point just beyond the, this is a pretty good proxy for the maximum of the potential. Um, I, will, I will subsequently discuss the importance of this HSR dash for the moment. You don't need to worry about it. Um, and then the other thing is if these these dashed and dot uh, these I guess dotted and dot dashed I never remember exactly which way Mathematica chooses to name these things so I guess these dotted and dash dashed lines are going to show you what would happen if you just took the Gaussian approach and just assumed that it was a Gaussian average. So what is the value of lambda? Is that point oh seven point five two? So th this this means that the Hubble scale is just a factor of a fifteenth down from where the turnover and the potential is. So in other words, that's why I'm saying, so the turnover and the potential is like here, right. and this HCL is right here. So just numerically, lambda is what? Oh, it's about, 10, it's about 10 to the 10 GB, okay. 10 to the 10 to the, between 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 
Um, okay? Uh, and you can ignore the black dot. For the moment. <coughs> there you go. So that's those are the, those are the sixty e folds. Those are the sixty e. Those are, that's over sixty e folds of inflation. And so staring at this, I think there are immediately a few notable features. The first is you notice. So there are two regimes in which you notice the effect of the potential. The first is you see that when you are not over the barrier, the potential actually has a stabilizing effect. So if you just went ahead and assumed it was Gaussian, like I said, you know, people had previously, you would be massively overestimating the growth of the fluctuations. Now that's no surprise. Obviously, it's a quartic potential. It has it's a positive quartic potential. It has a stabilizing effect. But it's important to include when you really want to understand the way in which the fluctuations are growing. The second thing you notice is this like really long tail that extends out very rapidly and um, you know very flat above the turnover and the potential. And what that is is that's exactly the effect of the unstable part of the potential, which is that that's greatly that means that once you get a fluctuation that starts sampling to the unstable part of the potential, the negative potential is really causing that fluctuation. You know. Once you're beyond, it's a tachyonic instability, and it's causing the Higgs field to just grow, to blow up in that region. And that means that you, your probability to find like a slightly larger, you know, a, your probability to find a slightly larger fluctuation than that is similar because any fluctuation that reaches there quickly grows onto the next part, and so you get this rapid diver, divergence of large fluctuations. Um, and so yeah, so, the, so as I mentioned, first thing is these long tails, the distribution spreads out beyond the, beyond the turnover because of the unstable potential. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, as you might have, like if you, as you might have noticed, I'm plotting this with respect to log of the probability. And I'm considering all the way down to e, effectively probabilities of e to minus 250. Why am I doing that? Well. Inflation takes whatever your initial patches that gave rise to our universe and inflates it into e to the 3n patches. So even though for my choice of parameters, it's very unlikely to have a fluctuation beyond the barrier, you know, only one, you know, one in e to the 180, there are 180 patches. So that means that, you know, even when the cutoff scale is much larger than the Hubble scale, I can still have these regions form in the past like one of our universe. So, given that the Hubble scale, given that even for Hubble scales that are within an order of magnitude of the actual cutoff scale, this can happen. We now need to know that what happens if we form these patches, and in particular, as I'm going to discuss, you only need to worry about are we forming one of these patches at all. And so that leads on to the next stage, which is you know what is the fate of these large fluctuations that sample beyond the barrier. So I've used the word large. So what do I mean by large? Well, um, the, first, the last time I gave this talk, it said Donuk Nunk Equus or something like that, which is apparently what Apple helpfully thinks is a good placeholder. Uh, but so what do we mean by large fluctuations? Well, let's break the evolution down into various regimes. So if you're below the turnover and the potential, then as mentioned, you're stabilized by a positive quartic. You, your fluctuations don't grow as much. Once you're beyond, your growth is accelerated by a negative quartic, but you can still consider it in the sort of Fokker-Planck regime. You still have the field evolving in a predominantly inflationary background. However, as mentioned, as I was mentioning when jotting on the board, at some point, the Higgs field locally becomes so large that it violates the slow roll assumption. And so at that point, I showed you that those tails were growing rapidly, but once you violate the slow roll assumption, first of all, the Fokker-Planck equation is no longer valid, and second of all, there, you're going to start, like, however fast those fluctuations are growing, they are going to start growing much, much faster. And so that was actually that second line in the plot, the HSR slash. That was denoting that that's actually where you expect the slow roll approximation to break down, and so all the probabilities shown beyond that were sort of unrealistically unrealistically suppressed. And so why do we care about that? Well, once you get to that point, 
it's not going to take you long to grow until you're sort of the geometric mean of H and M Planck. And at that point, the energy density in the Higgs field is comparable to the inflationary energy density. And so there, now I can't really talk about the Higgs in an inflating background because now the dynamics of the space-time are going to be determined by the Higgs field. And so what I mean by a large what I mean by a large fluctuation where I have to consider its effect on the space-time is this. But because of this fact that when I get to slow roll violation, the fluctuation starts growing so rapidly, I'm actually going to start with, I'm, I'm going to consider the Fokker-Planck era as having given me fluctuations up till they reach this point. And now I'm going to ask this question, when I reach this point, slow roll violation such that Fokker-Planck is no longer valid, what is subsequently going to happen? So, um, the way that we did this is like, like this becomes actually a very complicated process because now I have some large local fluctuation in an inflating space time and then this fluctuation is going to grow because it's violated slow roll and actually this turns out to not be, this turns out to be another question that is not, a, that you can get some handle on, uh, you can get some handle on analytically but really you have to ultimately resort to a numerical calculation to truly understand the dynamics in the system. And so um, here I'm going to have two plots. So this is this is an axisymmetric spacetime. Uh, I don't know if you can see. There's like this sort of purplish haze in here. Uh, not, I guess it's maroonish, and it also has nothing to do with Jimi Hendrix. But so there is a Gauss. What that represents is in here there is a Gaussian field distribution um, where the the center of the Gaussian is chosen to be this value at which slow roll has broken down. So this is modeling as if, you know, after all these Fokker Planck trends, after all these stochastic fluctuations and this growth through the potential, I finally ended up getting somewhere a local fluctuation in the Higgs field that was at the slow roll breakdown region. And so this is going to um, show the value of the Higgs field relative to the, the minimum of the potential. The minimum is some minimum we have put in way deep at the Planck scale. However, we have checked that our two things. First of all, our simulations are not sensitive to the fact that we started with a Gaussian. Second of all, our simulations are not sensitive to where we put in this, uh, where we put in this minimum of the potential for reasons that are going to be related to the evolution, which I'll try to mention. Um, but so this is going to give you the Higgs field value, and then this is going to give you the energy density in the field relative to the inflationary energy density which we're taking as a cosmological constant. And, you know, not only does this mean that I get to show more fun videos, I also get to uh, encourage audience participation. Would people prefer to see these one at a time? Or would they rather that I like double click really quickly and watch them simultaneously? So one at a time? Both. <laughs> simultaneously? Both. Both. Give okay. us a chance to see All the right. videos. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the Higgs field then. You know, that's actually the result that wins most often. So you can see that for a little while, you know, where this is the time, not very much is happening. The fluctuation is growing, though. You can see here it's really starting to intensify. And then you see all this crazy behavior, and you notice that you started seeing this inter... You started seeing this um, exchange between very yellow and very blue, and then you got this white with this yellow back this yellow outside in this blue background. So what is that? Well, what's happening is the field is starting to roll away, and it rolls away, and the fluctuation is growing, and then it starts rolling away faster and faster and faster, and finally, it starts rolling so fast that there's a combination of two things. First of all, you're used to thinking of like, oh, well, it's rolling faster, but its rolling is still damped. Well, once the energy density gets sufficiently negative, Actually, that turns the, a region that was locally expanding into a locally contracting region. So the rolling energy density is now no longer red shifting, it's blue shifting. So that leads to a blow up in energy density. Now at some point, the energy density inside a region becomes so large that you can't really think about, like, if you calculate the energy density relative to the radius, you find that there's an apparent horizon. And so that's what this white region is. From our simulations, we've excised things that would become black holes, and so are causally disconnected from the outside. And so to see this in energy density language, I think I'm sorry, I did 
So you see the energy density goes negative, and then it goes very positive in the center of that. And that's exactly this kinetic effect. And so what you end up with is you end up with like a black hole, which of course has positive mass, compensated for by a shell of negative energy density in your space time. So do people think they, do people still want to see it at the same time? Or? Yeah, I saw at least one head nod, so we can see it. And so if you watch here, you'll be able to see that, you know, the growth eventually gives a negative energy density, but then these, you, you know, then this rapid sort of oscillating behavior in the Higgs field, which is it oscillating around the true minimum, you know, and I should mention that I said that the location of the true minimum doesn't matter. Well, when you want to consider the field, when you want to consider the kinetic energy of the field, having the true minimum helps because it oscillates. But of course, even if it just had an unstable potential running all the way down, it would still accelerate down that, and you'd still get a large positive energy. Um, but so, what does this mean? This well, means first of all, what is that the th parameter that you're changing? Right, that's a great question. So, so what what why that you is? Why stop it? Where you do stop it? <laughs> pardon? Why, why is two the maximum Oh, we value? stop it because at that point the simulation sort of starts behaving in a... It okay, just but sort in of, the real universe, what value of THT is relevant here? Right, so, uh, so that's a great question, and that is um, exactly this. The first okay. bullet point, which is TH basically parameterizes the number of E-folds of inflation. <clears throat> so what this tells you is if you started with a big fluctuation, it only takes around one E-fold, for that to evolve to this, this black hole shell of energy density system. So the reason that I would say that is important is because I would say that that means that if I form one of these during inflation, in other words, if I reach this slow roll breakdown during inflation, nothing is going to stop this system from forming. There's, I'm not exiting, in, I'm not going to do anything where I exit inflation, I really efficiently <coughs> reheat and I stabilize the Higgs potential within one, EFO, within one inflationary EFO. So I would say that the sort of maximally conservative I can be is that one of, is to say that I will get one of these systems forming if it reaches the slow roll breakdown during inflation. You know, so um, so that's exactly what that th corresponds to. Another interesting thing that you see about this is you saw there were a lot of interesting dynamics going into it. This is not, you know, as I say, this is not your grandmother's bubble nucleation. This is not this is not actually exactly described by considering, you know, an ADS bubble in a de Sitter background. Now, um, that was, so it's interesting because the detail, that bubble approximation was first deployed by these authors in 2015, and while they contributed greatly to our understanding of the system and what happens to these bubbles, it's interesting because the details actually, the, the details differ significantly. Um, and that's partly because this is not a thin wall bubble. It's more like a broad Hubble-sized fluctuation. Um, and these dynamics are important to this formation of the black hole. And so, yeah, as mentioned, just the big thing that's happening is you get this contraction, blue shifting of the energy density, and that leads to a black hole compensated by a shell of negative energy density. But the really important upshot, at least from the standpoint of our universe, is that once you get this fluctuation in true vacuum region, you might have thought something like, oh, well, I have a negative energy density. Maybe that region of space is locally going to contract, and then I'm going to get some weird defect, like some black hole surrounded by a shell or something, and then inflation is going to inflate those away anyway. So who cares? But the important thing is, because of the inflation of space-time, uh, and in fact, even in the Minkowski limit, in spite of the fact that you have this negative energy density, this shell of negative energy density, which is locally contracting, the boundary is still moving outward, kind of like a bubble wall. And so it is indeed the case that this fluctuation and indeed the true vacuum region do grow during, during inflation and after inflation. And so that's exactly going back to this point I was just making, which is once I form one of these regions, not only do I form it quickly, but it is going to persist throughout inflation. And then you're going to exit inflation, and then you're going to have this region of true vacuum nucleating in our Minkowski space, and that would preclude me from being here to give this talk. So that allows us... Um, so that's what's going to allow us to put some phenomenological bounds on this scenario.
Uh, however, some other notable results, well, just for me. go back to that, go back to the So we're considering T over H, uh, you know, 60 E folds or something like that. Is that what it is? The way right. I just think about this. So, uh, so, so I sort of extrapolate that you know, dotted curves up to 60 and say, okay, well, but there's nothing left, no space left for the normal fluctuation. So, so, so there are two things that go into that. So first of all, it, it, expand, it continues to expand. It, it does not actually expand faster than the surrounding space line. So there's always more space, at least during inflation. So there's always more space being created outside of it. So that's one thing. It's never going to overtake and destroy all of the space. The second thing is this parameter that I'm using is only from the point at which I reach the slow roll break. So before I worry about this, I still have to go through all the Fokker point evolution <laughs> to get one of these regions in the first place. So if you remember in the plot of the Fokker Planck distribution evolution, I only reached the sort of you know significant level for probability by which I'm going to say sort of e to the minus one eight one eighty ish after about say fifty eight e folds. So it's fifty eight e folds plus the other one that this takes to happen that is really the full time scale for the evolution, of, for the uh, development of one of these during inflation and not just, you, you know, you don't just start with the big fluctuation necessarily. Right. That's right, but we can't, we can't remain in the good part of the vacuum or, you know, our universe or something like that. That's what I'm a little bit confused about. I mean, say that normal vacuum is still dominant. Um, right. So we could could we live in just a normal vacuum even though there's this expanding bad vacuum? Yeah, so region? I'm so I'll, I'll get I'll get to the way we think about the bounce in just a second. Okay. So can can I if I don't answer your question, can you hit me with it again? Okay. And I'm gonna defer it just to note a few other GR things right. and then I'll get back. So um yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the interesting, one of the very interesting things about this and exactly why it turns out we're not sensitive to exactly what, you know, how we make a true minimum for the, for the, for the, for the potential is that the initial true vacuum region growth is actually, like, it actually can be space-like rather than time-like, so this, or null. So this is not like, this is really not like an expanding null bubble in the coleman Lucha sense, um, because what's really happening is not that it's a bubble sweeping outwards, but what's really happening is that locally, at each successive point, the field is like falling away to the true vacuum so quickly that it's not, it doesn't actually care that its adjacent point has. The only reason it cares that its adjacent point has is because, you know, sort of like I'm interpolating from a large Higgs value down to a small Higgs value, and so if the outside space is in the small Higgs value, then for one point, the point next to it is a slightly smaller value. But each of those are falling away independently, very rapidly under just the equations of motion, and not because they're like being pulled by the adjacent point. And so that means that because this initial growth is space-like, it's insensitive to what's going on deep in the interior. And that's part of the reason that I see this shell growing, even though I've got local contraction inside it. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that, um, as I mentioned, this is insensitive to the fact that, uh, this is insensitive to the profile we chose. So the fact that I showed you the Gaussian case, we can work with other more interesting <laughs> cases. And that's relevant because, as I said, this comes as a result of the fact that these local fluctuations that are everywhere different and there's some probability distribution. And so there's no reason to believe I necessarily start with a Gaussian. But, it turns out that you can get, uh, in this setup, you can get weirder, um, weirder situations. Like one thing you can get is you can get sort of arbitrarily elongated black holes. And this is interesting because it appears that you might even be able to take this all the way to the infinite limit and get things that look like black strings, which would be, um, so I should say violation. But so this would be a violation of the hoop conjecture, which is that, you know, if you can, which sort of states that, uh, like, oh, if I, if I could draw, if I could draw a hoop around a certain mass, then that would be a black hole. Um, but that, of course, like drawing hoops around strings is not something you can do. And so uh, this is interesting because the hoop conjecture holds in De Sitter space, 
but it doesn't hold an anti to center space. And in this case, because you kind of have this black hole that's shielded by this, this what looks like an anti to center region, and then outside of that is a to center region, it kind of looks like a violation. So if you have this decoupling of nearby points, then I would expect that typically the behavior would be very highly non-isotropic. Um, in your simulations, did you include this, or were you uh, just doing spherical symmetry? So, so we, we did we did axis symmetry, and okay. so indeed when you when when we set up the profile so that it's not initially x and y symmetric. We do, I'm sorry, z and x, y symmetric. We see that the, the z behavior is different than the x, y behavior. And it still continues to grow sort of like in each direction the way you kind of think would make sense. Like there are no weird oddities that show up. But yeah, we did check that. And we also consider sort of like just a two-dimensional space-time treated as though we're a third-dimensional space-time. So as if you just had a completely isotropic third dimension and we see similar sorts of behavior. Because there, there's a bunch of old work in relativity about this kind of behavior. This is what happens near a space-like singularity. It's called BKL behavior. And a lot is known about almost generic properties of solutions of the field equations when you are in a limit where nearby points decouple. Hmm. Interesting. I'm, yeah. I must admit I'm not familiar with that literature. I should okay. definitely look into that. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's definitely. I, that sounds like what you're getting here. Yeah, no, and, and, and we are always excited to make, you, you know, like I said, it's, it's been a learning experience in QFT and cosmology as opposed to just a phenomenological exercise. And so we're always looking for things like that to try to make connection to and to, you know, as a sanity check. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, the buzzword for this decoupling is asymptotic silence. Okay, BKL and asymptotic silence. Yeah, because points can't talk to each other. Interesting. Yeah, I'll be very interested. Okay. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, so now to go to the implications for our universe, you know, well, what does this mean? Well, so just, you know, the sort of necessary inflationary ingredient is you can trace back and you can say, okay, well, our observable universe must have undergone 50 to 60 equals of inflation. And what that means specifically is it means that if I started with a patch, that patch inflated 50 to 60 e folds, and then all of those 50 to 60 e folds from that patch are, are you know, they are now my past light come basically in this universe. And so in terms of you were saying, oh, well, could I live in some part of the universe where this transition didn't happen? In principle, like in principle you could, that becomes a sort of pre-question about the inflationary epoch. But the minimal thing I can say is, okay, well, let's suppose I started with a patch in the electric vacuum. Now what I want is I want that patch to undergo the necessary 50 to 60 e-folds without forming one of these. Because if I did form one during those 50 to 60 e then that would be in my past light cone and that would be capable of nucleating and destroying. So that's what I'm going to use is sort of the minimal example to try to place bounds. And what that translates into is sort of the equivalent of the expected number of patches within three, and the expected number of patches that have reached this slow roll breakdown and formed one of these systems after n e-folds needs to, in the e to the three n e-folds that I formed, needs to be less than one. Um, and so the fun thing about that is you can take that and then you can go say, okay, let's just go hog wild, standard model, valid, all the way up to the Planck scale, and let's make connection to the top and the Higgs mass. And so this is a plot that people might be familiar with from um, you know, numerous sort of metastability papers. But so here we have the top mass, which is standing in for the Yukawa coupling, which of course is what drives the quartic coupling negative, and so that's um, or leads to this turnover in the potential. So that's, uh, you know, so smaller top masses make you more stable. And then we have the Higgs mass, which is what sets your boundary condition for the running, your quartic coupling. And so we have various different regions. So first of all, we derive a pretty, a largely pretty independent bound on the exact shape of the potential that tells you that the Hubble scale needs to be about this factor of 14, which motivates why I showed that plot. Um, and so then you can say, okay, well, as, mentioned, as, you were, as you were saying at the beginning of the talk, now just at the edge of the two sigma region, thanks to the most recent measurements, 
the potential stable all the way up to the Planck scale. Then we have this interesting blue band. In that blue band, it turns out that the instability scale is higher than the maximum Hubble scale, based on the R is 0.07 limit that we have from Planck. So we could be totally happy living in that blue band. We would still have the instability, but whatever, if we do have slow roll inflation, whatever form it took, it must have allowed us to exit. This red area is, well, in the future, we think we're going to be able to probe point, uh, R of around 2 times 10 to the minus 3. This entire red region would be ex this entire red region would be a region where we had an inconsistency if we saw such an R. Sorry, um, I lost that. What is the R? Okay. So sorry, R is the right. I should have defined that. R is the tension to scalar ratio, and it is an, oh, yeah. it is okay. exactly mappable to the measurement of the Hubble constant during inflation. Um, so in this region, the Hubble constant would take some value. You know, would have to take a value that was above ten to the thirteen, in which case this entire region would be ruled out. And then there's this white region which will either turn blue or red depending on whether we see anything between R of 0.07 and R of 0.02. Um, and so that's one thing you can say. Now you might say, like, wait, I am a great, I am a great believer in reheating, and I believe that you could have, um, like, I want to know what would the bounds look like if in fact I said that, well, you can fluctuate beyond the barrier. I agree you don't want to form one of these patches, but you can fluctuate like, you can fluctuate beyond the barrier, but reheating, sorry, you say, so, so the scenario I'm talking about says, I didn't form any of these patches, maybe I fluctuated beyond the barrier, but maybe reheating is so efficient that anything that had fluctuated beyond the barrier was driven back right after the inflationary epoch ended by thermal corrections, and so, you know, I only care if you honestly form one of these places, these patches during inflation. You say, no, I don't care about that. I don't think reheating is that efficient. I just want to know what are the bounds if you just say, no, you can't have sampled the unstable part of the potential at all in your past light cone. And it turns out that actually the bounds are fairly similar to this. And once again, that's due to those long tails and the fact that once you're beyond the barrier, you diverge so rapidly that it doesn't take you too much longer um, to actually form one of these systems. So it looks like I have a few minutes um, just to talk about some things that go beyond this absolutely minimal uh, set of assumptions. So one thing is you could say, oh, well, like, what if we needed additional contributions to the Higgs potential? Could those in any way save us? Well, one of, I think, the interesting ones is, you know, many people talk about just scalar fields getting Hubble scale masses during inflation, as frequently talked about in the context of moduli, or in the context of, um, uh, like, um, like uh, affectine baryogenesis. And so you could say, uh, well, let's just imagine that, you know, for example, like, for example, you could just couple the Higgs to the inflationary potential, which in slow roll, I think, is invariant. So this H squared V coupling is invariant. And then when I plug in the inflationary energy density, I get something that looks like this. And it turns out that if this coefficient that I've called C1 is greater than or around a half, then of course you still have an instability during inflation because this is only a quadratic term and the quartic wins out eventually at some large enough field value. But with this value of the with this value of C1, you delay you produce a, a large enough barrier that that will prevent you from transitioning out during inflation, um, or at least for the 50 to 60 volts. So that's one interesting possibility. Now, one thing you could say is, well, okay, now I'm coupled to the infliton. Well, then the infliton starts to oscillate, and then you know maybe the large oscillations in the infliton are going to induce large fluctuation in the Higgs field, and so via sort of parametric resonance-like effects. And maybe those could, you know, maybe I was stabilized, but now those oscillations are going to sort of undo the stabilization and drive me back over the barrier. Um, and so this has been looked at by these authors. It's an interesting question. Here's an example from a lattice simulation where you see exactly that the oscillation, normalized oscillations in the infoton lead to oscillations in the, the Higgs field, and then at some point it just starts rolling away due to an instability. Um, but it turns out that the constraints are mild. For example, you need a in, this, in the example I gave, you'd need a Planck suppressed operator with a coefficient of 10 to the 3. I, you know, I don't know what to think about Planck suppressed physics, but that, seem, that seems large. But it's an interesting thing to think about. And it's also interesting if you imagine that for some reason inflation was related not to the Planck scale, but to like the gut scale. 
And so this was a slightly lower, you know, and this should be like an M star instead of an M plank, and then maybe this is an order one correlation. Um, so that's another possibility. Then there's also, as I mentioned, this possibility of reheating, which is that maybe, you know, thermal effects drive you back to the electric vacuum. As mentioned in principle, that relaxes bounds. In practice, it doesn't relax it very much because the Higgs field flux, because you have a cortic, you know, cortics are in some sense strong self interact, like, or important self interactions, and so they rapidly, you know, that really accelerates your instability. Um, and this also would require reheating to be efficient because. Once you're over the barrier and inflation ends, you no longer have Hubble friction, or as much Hubble friction, you're going to start rolling away, and so you'd need to thermalize that system fairly rapidly to be able to stabilize it as well. Um, and then finally, you can start asking like you know questions that have to do with you know the the in, initial conditions for inflation anyway, and you could say, well, you know, we talked about one fluctuation. We said one fluctuation is bad, but what if I wanted to imagine like that we lived in some like lucky region that did not have any of these transitions, even though they were likely to have happened. But we had a long period of inflation that produced many such regions, and you know, then like there were transitions within that. Well, you can start asking, um, you you can start talking about like crazier possibilities, which I've thought about but haven't really done anything on. Which you know, crazier ideas like well. You know, what if 50% of your space transitioned to the true vacuum? Well, now you have an inflating space time in which 50% of the space is actually, you know, some black hole crunching space time mess. Um, and there's an interesting paper by Sakino, Shankar, and Suskind, in which they talk about this in the context of internal inflation and like various topological phase, global phases for space time. And uh, they determined that if you do get to about this 50% level, level, then maybe you can't globally sustain inflation anyway, and so maybe you could try to put a bound on the total number of inflates. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's not an exactly concrete direction at the moment, but you know, there are these sort of interesting ideas that this, this problem makes you start to speculate about, and makes you start to wonder if there could be weirder connections between, you know, a system we think about and, you know, more complicated inflationary cosmology. Um, but yeah, so just in my last couple of minutes to conclude, uh, so the basics of this system are once you reach this solar roll breakdown, you get very rapid divergence of the true vacuum. You end up forming an expanding shell of negative energy density surrounding a black hole. And the formation of any of those regions, you know, those persist throughout inflation, if they form in our past light cone, that would preclude, you can say that would preclude the existence of our universe in the electric vac vacuum. And so that allows you to place bounds on the scale of inflation relative to the scale of the term potential. And so the implications are, you know, you can, not only is this an interesting system because you sort of learn a lot about cosmology and QFD and you start thinking about these interesting questions of unstable fields during inflation, but you can also make, connect, you can try to make connections and you could try to argue that, oh, well, there are regions in the MHMT plane that are incompatible with measurements in R. And so maybe if we had a measurement of you know, a, a non-zero scale tensor ratio, this would convince us that there had to be some BSM physics coming in somewhere, turning the Higgs potential over. Now, this could happen anywhere before the turnover of the potential, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be collider measurable physics, but it is a nice way to make a connection between what a cosmological measurement might be able to tell us about these, you know, many, like what I like to think of as these, you know, many E-folds of energy scales that only cosmology can or has reached. Um, another question that you can ask is whether this presents in your mind, you know, if the standard model potential were to look like this, uh, is this an additional challenge for inflationary models? Like, how do you feel now about the initial conditions you had to have to start inflation in the first place? And how do you feel about, you know, how, like, these, this would require a very low scale model of inflation with a very flat potential, and those tend to be hard to model for. Um, and then finally, you can start thinking about, like, are there simple reconciliations? Maybe this tells us something about a Higgs inflaton coupling. And I think that it leads to a lot of interesting questions that you can speculate about, and, you know, maybe even make, connect, maybe even try to make connection with other processes, like if there are other scalar fields or variogenesis or, you know, 
you know, similar sort of dynamics might be relevant to something where there's tunneling and there's classical evolution and there's turnover the potential like the relaxion. Um, so I think it's a cool problem. I think it, you know, works at the interface of a lot of different aspects of physics. And it's, you know, been a blast to work on and a blast to talk to you guys about. So thank you very much for your time.